Now look, there are a finite number of ways to pronounce most combination of letters in the English language. We know, we've received your emails on the matter numerous times over the years. And sure, even within that very gross generalization, there are lots of variations and ways to trip up that, at the time, seem perfectly correct and legitimate. We know, we've received your emails on the matter numerous times over the years. Fortunately, there are a number of aids to help you determine how to pronounce a given English word or phrase. There are also an approximately equal number of aids that will happily help you mispronounce a given English word or phrase. We're sure you've come across the YouTube videos from Pronunciation Manual that claim to be helpful pronunciation guides for celebrity names and popular words and phrases. For example, this one, which, believe it or not, is a guide to Xerxes. Kicker Kikis. Kicker? The Kikis. Kicker Kiki. Humorous efforts aside, it's a real minefield out there to try to properly pronounce words especially when a given sound can be spelled in a variety of ways. Oftentimes, many of these mispronunciations come across because people read words but never hear them spoken, whether that's because they read above their grade level or simply because they don't mix in the sorts of circles in which those words are commonly used. And sure, you can take a stab at it, but if you don't have reason to suspect you might be wrong, you certainly aren't going to think you need a dictionary to help you sort it out. Of course, Listeners of audiobooks have the opposite problem. Lots of information on how to pronounce a word, very little info on spelling. And really, that is perhaps the most annoying source of mispronunciations. Words that have just been plain old made up. Take, for example, G-I-F. You know, the graphically interchangeable formatting. It's not that no one knows how to say it, it's that everyone is sure they know how to say it, and will fiercely defend the hill they are about to die on to make sure that everyone else in the world knows their preferred pronunciation. GIF or JIF, we don't care. We're taking Mike Rugnetta's suggestion of equally appropriate pronunciation and going with JIF. For more on that, see our episode on the GIF, though not really. Nothing is as annoying to us as a word that just appears in the language without any auditory hints as to how it might be spoken. Although, fair enough, that is how most words arrive at the best of times. At that point, you have to fall back on the classical rules of pronunciation, which no one actually knows. No, not even your grade school English teacher. Oh, you'll have learned a bunch of them and forgotten almost all, but mostly what you've learned is wrong. For example, there are more words that disobey the I before E except after C except words like neighbor and way rule than follow it. It's not really a rule at that point, is it? Certainly not one you should rely on. Sadly, it's pretty much the only spelling rule anyone can remember. It's weird, though, how caffeine policies result in species seizures, don't you think? Anyway, what's obviously going on here is that we are making the case for pronouncing today's word any reasonable way you want. Why are we doing that? Well, because for years and years and years, practically since the day it was introduced to the Dungeons and Dragons public in the Blackmore Supplement from 1975, no one has been quite sure how to pronounce the word S-A-H-U-A-G-I-N. Go ahead. You take a stab at it. We'll wait. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. So how did you do? Back in the mid-70s, just about anyone could write or call into the TSR offices and speak to someone working on D&D. And the guys at D&D, Gary and the gang, loved this sort of thing. It was practically a basket of free ideas handed off to them willingly by their adoring fan base. So when a young Stephen Marsh wrote in one day and handed Gary Gygax all the info he needed to write up the Ketoblapest in the strategic review, he was thanked, given a pat on the head, and sent on his way. Well, not quite, but you can hear more about that in our Ketoblapest episode. Flushed with success, Marsh wrote in again, this time with information on what he thought the elemental plane of water should be like. A classic case of nominative determinism, if ever we saw one. 
For those of you unfamiliar with the phrase nominative determinism, it simply means that someone has a job that fits their name. The oral surgeon who removed our wisdom teeth, for instance, was Dr. Slaughter. Other examples include retired New York meteorologist Storm Field, Lieutenant Les McBurney of the Sun Prairie Fire Department, and a lawyer named, no joke, Sue Yu. The whole nominative determinism concept was put forward in 1994 by New Scientist magazine, when they noticed a number of research papers they had reported on were written by folks with strangely appropriate names. New Scientist theorized there was some subconscious causal relationship between a person's name and the work they took on. So really, nominative determinism is the name of the theory rather than the actual effect. If you really want to point out someone whose name matches their field of interest, the word you really want is aptronym. Someone whose name is apt for their occupation. Like Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone. And Thomas Crapper, whose invention we bet you can guess incorrectly, but whose real job was sanitary engineer and whose real claim to fame was nine patents improving an already existing essential piece of household equipment. Incidentally, don't write in to tell us his name is the reason we refer to certain bodily waste with a four-letter slang word. That story is, as you might expect, a load of crap. But we digress. When Stephen Marsh wrote in about the plane of water, he gave a very detailed explanation of it and included many different monsters and other NPCs to populate it. And since Dave Arneson was in the middle of writing the Blackmore module, guess where most of the critters and creatures ended up? Put in place to help fill out Blackmore's swamp and ocean setting. Among the creations were the aquatic elves, the Ixitzachitil, and the thing we have yet to pronounce ourselves, thus settling the debate. Though, how about that Itzitzachitil pronunciation, eh? What, those didn't sound alike to you? Well, it's hardly our fault that no one can agree on how a completely made-up name is pronounced. After all, as we mentioned in our Catoblopas episode, every creature in the various monster manuals over the years should have come with a pronunciation guide. It really would have made things so much easier. Dritzt, drist, dritz. Then again... So would consistency of spelling. But that's another discussion altogether. Of course, at the time we wrote that, Wizards of the Coast hadn't yet fully rolled out the D&D Beyond website. Though we prefer hard copies of our gaming material, which we can buy all at once instead of being nickel and dime to death trying to buy only electronic bits of it, we do have to admit it has one or two handy features. See, being an online repository of all things D&D, at least for the current edition, it does allow for the use of more than just the print medium to get the point across. And Wonder of Wonders, one of the things they eventually included was a pronunciation guide to some of the more difficult creatures. Provided you've paid to have access to the particular book in which your source of confusion exists. But we'll come back to that. For all his hard work developing things that eventually ended up in bits and pieces in the Blackmore supplement, Marsh was paid the handsome sum of two exposures and a special thanks credit on the credits page for suggestions and contributions. It's probably worth noting at this stage that he would later go on to become a lawyer. We can't imagine why. Eventually, of course, he did get his shot at really messing up D&D by talking Gygax into adding good and evil to the alignment system. After that, he worked for a summer at TSR as lead writer for the Dungeons & Dragons expert set of 1981. Now, Blackmore was all well and good. The Sahuagin got a heck of a write-up in the supplement, bigger than any other creature or NPC. Clearly, they were meant to be quite a challenge and to be an ongoing sort of problem for adventurers down through their career. Unfortunately, they had a major problem with their design and because of it, they never quite took off as intended. See, the Sahagan were an aquatic species, and at the time, the last place any adventurer was interested in spending any time at all was in the water. After all, too much of their equipment would rust up and weigh them down. Swimming in seized up plate mail is very nearly the least amount of fun you can have at the table. No, back then, almost all the best adventures were had in the mazes and tunnels underground, rather than underwater. So the Sahuagin, for all their promise, 
were left by the wayside. When Steve Marsh was asked what inspired the creatures, he had an answer. The problem is, it isn't a very good one. According to him, the inspiration came from an old Justice League of America animated TV show, which he then mixed with a bit of Aztec lore and some speculation about evolved sharks. And we're okay with the Aztec thing. And the shark thing, fair enough. But that animated Justice League of America TV show? That bugs us. For one thing, everyone assumes he meant the Super Friends and lets it go at that. But we don't recall any episode of the Super Friends that had that sort of thing in it. Not a one. Everyone is wrong. Fortunately, we didn't have to do the footwork to figure out why it was wrong. Nope. That glory goes to the Retroist website, which did what we were about to do, and for the same reasons. We knew the timeline was all wibbly-wobbly, and were about to dig in and pull it apart when we found Retroist and saved ourselves some effort. Let us explain. Super Friends was an animated series that ran on ABC off and on from 1973 to 1985. It changed narrative style, official title, premise, and frankly, quality quite a bit over its run. The show featured Superman, Batman and Robin, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and because for some reason that wasn't enough to engage kids in the cartoon, a trio of sidekicks, we guess. Wendy, Marvin, and Wonder Dog. Though, if they were sidekicks, what was Robin? Wendy, Marvin, and the dog had no superpowers whatsoever, but insisted on running around in capes and getting in the way anyway. Now, some of you are going to start jumping up and down right away and insisting we've got it all wrong. It was Zan, Jaina, and Gleek, and one of them could do water things, and the other could do animal things, and the monkey was named Gleek for some reason, which really didn't catch on until high school as a name for some sort of weird spitting thing. But you're wrong. Zan and Jaina and Gleek were not in the Super Friends. See, the Super Friends with Wendy and Marvin and Wonder Dog ran from 1973 to 1974 originally. And then everything was cancelled with only 16 episodes in the can. And those episodes were repeated over and over until August of 1974 when it finally went off the air. But then the Six Million Dollar Man and Wonder Woman live action shows hit the TV and all of a sudden ABC wanted some more of that superhero action because it was all the rage again. So back came the Super Friends in 1976 with those same 16 episodes while in the background, ABC and Filmation were busy making a relaunch series called the all new Super Friends Hour. That's where, for a further 15 episodes in 1977 and 1978, Zan and Jaina and Gleek came from. Wendy, Marvin, and the dog were gone, never to return. And then there was the challenge of the Super Friends with Legion of Doom, Black Vulcan, Apache Chief Samurai, and Hawkman, followed by the world's greatest Super Friends, which mixed and matched previous episodes of All New and Challenge. Then Super Friends, where they forgot how word spacing works and suddenly the Super Friends could only go for seven minutes before needing to recharge their sun batteries, and all the episodes look so very tired and familiar that it's not even worth talking about the rest of the variations on the theme, and besides, we were in junior high school by then, and who watches cartoons for little kids anyway? Where were we? Oh yeah, timing, right. Blackmore came out in 1975, right? Which means the only Super Friends available at the time was that first 16-episode run. Which means it's easy to check which episode provided the inspiration for Marsh's new creatures. Probably it was an Aquaman episode, given that these usually all happened at sea. Though, it was the lack of much for Aquaman to do in the various versions of Super Friends that led to the Aquaman is useless set of memes. Generally, in any given Super Friends iteration, he got about one episode that was specifically geared to he and his fish-based powers. So, like we were going to do, Retroist went to check which episode it was that gave us the difficult-to-pronounce-correctly Blackmore NPCs. And what they found was exactly what we suspected they would find, what we suspected we would find if we went to look. 
because we had no memory of anything even remotely similar in any Super Friends episode we had ever seen. And that's exactly what Retroist found when they checked. Nothing. No episode even hints at such creatures. There was no old animated Justice League of America cartoon. Steve Marsh lied. Except, Steve Marsh is a lawyer still, as far as we know. So, Steve Marsh absolutely positively did not lie in any way, shape, or form, and it would be irresponsible of us or anyone else to make that claim, and thereby damage his reputation and standing within the community of not only lawyers, but more importantly, gamers. No, Steve Marsh did not lie, he was merely mistaken. Because Retroist was able to find the actual source. We'll let Retroist explain what they found. I went back to the original Aquaman animated series, which ran from September 1967 to June 1970. In the second episode of the series, the Rampaging Reptile Men, we meet some, well, Rampaging Reptile Men. They don't look exactly like the creatures we would become familiar with, but they are evil and intelligent water-dwelling creatures. I could easily see Marsh confusing the various DC Heroes TV shows, so perhaps these are the creatures that would inspire his Devil Men of the Deep. The only thing we'll add to that is that the Aquaman show was a repackaging of the 1967 animated series The Superman Aquaman Hour of Adventure, which no doubt added to Marsh's confusion. There. Solved at last. The true story of the origins of this... No, 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 no. Wait, we have one last point to make one which might, from a certain point of view, help provide a definitive explanation of what inspired these creatures. But we have to bounce around in time a bit to do it, although once we get where we're going, that'll probably make all the sense in the world. In 1996, for the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition game, TSR embarked on a series of books called Monstrous Arcana. Each source book in the series was meant to show, in great detail, everything there was to know about some of the most popular monsters in the game. Along with these source books, there were to be three adventures available to help DMs and players explore the various aspects of the monster in question. Sadly though, TSR was in its last throes as a viable company. The next year, Wizards of the Coast would step in and buy the company up, end many ongoing projects, and just a few years later launch third edition. As a result, only three volumes of Monstrous Arcana were ever released. One on the Beholder, one about Mind Flayers, and the one we are interested in, the second in the series. Written by Skip Williams, The Sea Devils came out in 1997 and was one of the first books published by Wizards of the Coast for D&D, though it's likely this is only because it was one of the most complete. Now, you'll note the name of the book is not the same as the official name of the creatures. Which is fine. Lots of D&D critters get a variety of names depending on where you run into them, how they've been handled over the years in the various editions, and lots of behind the scenes stuff that we'd really rather not hash out again. See our episode on Malabranchi. Sea Devils is just one of those alternate names provided for by the lore and publishing history, along with Devilmen of the Deep. But here's where the problem starts. See, there's one more thing Marsh has said about the NPCs he created, and that is that he got the name for them from the name of a Spanish historian on the back of the Christ in the Americas pamphlet as provided by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, that pamphlet came out in the early 70s, and it has been rendered available online, so we went looking, hoping to find a pronunciation hint in the actual inspiration. And you'll never guess what we found. That's right. Nothing. It's not there. Again, Steve Marsh is a lawyer, so we'd never accuse him of lying. Probably he's just mistaken again. Because you see, we think we might know where he actually got it from. We're probably totally wrong. But let us give you the evidence anyway. In the 70s, in America... The public broadcasting service, PBS, was affiliated with a number of small public TV stations all over the country. And they were all pretty desperate for programming, especially in the evening after all the Sesame Street, Electric Company, and Mr. Rogers had played out. 
they needed programming for an audience older than grade schoolers. And what they got, through a deal assisted by PBS, was Doctor Who. The original series, not all this newfangled stuff. Stuff from the 60s and 70s. So episodes of Doctor Who were available to view in the States for anyone in range of a public TV station and the ability to find them. We lucked into it one night and discovered the fourth Doctor, Tom Baker. However, the third Doctor, played by John Pertwee, had numerous adventures under his belt by the time 1975 rolled around, one of which featured he and companion Joe facing off once more against his arch-nemesis, the Master. In the third serial of the ninth season of Doctor Who, which would make it 1972 originally, everyone was all at sea in an adventure called The Sea Devils. And yes, it featured an underwater aquatic race of lizardy people who, in the show, were members of the Silurian species. And they have a distinct dislike of surface dwellers for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that they once ruled the planet until the monkeys somehow took over. Now, that could all just be coincidence, and it could be that Marsh never saw the show, but we bet someone somewhere knows all this. Because for years, since they were first introduced, the official pronunciation of S-A-H-U-A-G-I-N was Sahuagin. But if you go to D&D Beyond today and pull up the entry on them, you can hear famed voice artist Matt Mercer officially pronounce them on an official Wizards of the Coast product as Sahuagin. Sa who again? It's a who again? Makes you think, doesn't it? Thank you very kindly for listening to this episode. We appreciate every moment you spent with it. Incidentally, any words you might have heard in this episode that sounded a bit off were probably done intentionally to see if you were paying attention and caught all of them. Probably. We've updated our merchandise store on Redbubble, and even if we do say it ourselves, it's a pretty impressive selection of interesting designs. In particular, we're very fond of the way the backpack, duffel bags, and socks came out. You can check out the rest of the stuff, as well as other ways to support the show by going to our support page at gmwordoftheweek.com. And any way you want to help us is fine by us. And we appreciate each and every one of you who do so. Thanks, gang. You can read the Retroist blog and catch their podcast at retroist.com. Let them know you appreciate them if you swing by. We'd have had to have watched eight hours of rather flaky 70s superhero cartoons otherwise. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who had to remind people all through grade school that it's B-R-I-A-N and not B-R-A-I-N, though we always appreciated the compliment. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. A constant threat to man, beast, and fish are the voracious Sahuagin, whose only friends seem to be the equally voracious and predatory giant sharks. Although of an intelligence equal to the elves in many respects, the Sahuagin have taken and perverted virtually every aspect of civilization to support their sadistic, cannibalistic culture. Mm-hmm.